If you come up with a blue hymnal out of them pews, I want to see it. Uh, <laughs> maybe red hymnal, turn to hymnal 113. <laughs> God, it's one of the best things that ever happened in the history of the universe, God, um, that Jesus came and died on that old rugged cross for me. And God, for everybody else in this room and out, out there in the YouTube people watching, and I pray that we'll just never forget, uh, God, uh, uh, where our salvation comes from. Help us tonight. Uh, God, come back and get us soon. And Lord, uh, tell you do, Help us to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. When we walk with the Lord In the light of His Word What a glory He sheds on our way While we do His good will He abides with us still all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 
down and wild in the skies, but it smiles quickly, drives it away. Not a death nor a fear, not a sign nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil He doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a friend nor a cross, but it's blessed if we trust and obey. Let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Last week we covered all the Lord's Table stuff and the end of the chapter I have the Lord's Table. And I don't know about you, but uh, I certainly was glad to have the Lord's Table. It's been a long time since we had it. Now, in chapter number 12 in 1 Corinthians... Paul kind of changes gears a little bit, and he heads off on a different subject. Um, he's been having a lot to say about, uh, you know, um, the brethren and the way they've been behaving and, and different things. And then he gets to chapter 12, and he's going to start talking about spiritual gifts. But we have the first three verses of this chapter are very interesting and they're very uh, they're uh, something that uh, is uh, very much needed to be spread abroad amongst the church uh, folks uh, today um, has been for a long time let's let's read uh, chapter 12 1 Corinthians verse number one now concerning spiritual gifts so notice this is spiritual gifts these are not physical gifts. Brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense being taught about spiritual gifts nowadays. Uh, partly because people are ignorant and partially because they're being controlled by somebody else but God. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as ye were led. Wherefore, 
I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, help us now as we try to understand this very important thing for us to know. And Lord, uh, help us to carry it with us when we go visiting places. And when we hear visiting preachers come in the church, and even when we hear ourselves preach, God, that we know we're on the mark and on the target. Help us, Lord, to know what's what and who's who and what they're speaking for and who they're speaking for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight I'd like to preach on how to tell a God-sent messenger. How to tell a God-sent messenger. Not everybody that gets up and preaches out of the King James Bible is going to be a God sent messenger. Not everybody that calls himself a Baptist or a Bible believer is really truly uh, that thing. Um, and sometimes they can be part of the group that we recognize as one of those things that we're part of, but yet still not be somebody that God sent along to deliver a message. Um, I know a lot of uh, people in the past that have got up and uh, just something wasn't right about it. It just kind of went over the pulpit. and went, Now, that's not to say that people's sermons don't flop. I've had a lot of flops. Uh, when I was on the road, uh, I probably had quite a few of them. But um, most of the time... I dealt with a confidence that I knew I was God's man with God's message. And even if it flopped, there was enough people that got the message in the congregation that I was preaching to where I knew God was still in the thing. Um, now, you can't tell God's messenger by results, okay? Uh, I know a lot of people that get a lot of results and they got big churches and they got lots of numbers and they got lots of money and they got lots of buildings and they got TV ministries and radio ministries and all kinds of ministries and that doesn't mean they're uh, God's man, uh, no, not in the least. Some of the biggest uh, publishers in the world are the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not God's man. They're not God's people. They're not spreading God's gospel. Um, one of the biggest churches... In the world is the Roman Catholic Church out of Rome. Uh, it is in no sense of any kind God's messenger uh, on this planet. Um, they got more money than everybody. Um, that doesn't make, uh, you know, just look, just because you got a big missions program doesn't mean anything. Uh, these are very simple principles that I'm going to tell you about tonight. Now, if we flip back through history, I want to talk for a few minutes by way of introduction about the Virginia Baptists and the colonial period of the United States. In 1607, Virginia was established as an English colony. In 1619, the Church of England was established as the official state church of Virginia's colony. And it stayed that way uh, basically till. Uh, 1768. Um, but people were coming over from England that weren't Church of England. People were coming over from Germany that were Lutherans. People were coming over from Scotland that were Presbyterians. So the Virginia legislature in uh, 1689 uh, uh, following the British Act of Toleration they allowed Baptists, Lutherans, and Presbyterians to have churches and, and pay their own ministers. Up until that time when you paid your tithe, it went to the Church of England, and they paid the Church of England's guy. And if you were a Baptist, you either had to preach for free, or else you had to, your congregation had to double dig in their pockets to pay you. Well, everything seemed like it was going to be okay. But then we fast forward about 100 years, and in the colony of Virginia, all of a sudden, mostly Baptists were being persecuted. Between 1768 and 1774, about half of the Baptist preachers in Virginia were in jail. 
So what did they have against the Baptist? Well, you see, the Baptist, uh, they weren't all the, the, the plantation owners. They all blamed to the, 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 the Episcopal Church up there on the hill. Uh, but the Baptists, they went out to the field and they got the slaves saved. And they got the old poor dirt farmer that didn't have any slaves saved. And they got the shopkeeper saved down in town and, and, and the people down at town hall. And all of a sudden, the Baptists were outnumbering everybody else uh, on the hillside. And they were going, well, we've got to put a stop to this. It's those old stinky Baptist preachers. We've got to stop them. So they started persecuting them. One of our founding fathers, Patrick Henry, made his career out of defending Baptist preachers in Virginia. I bet you didn't know that. Uh, he, he took up that banner after seeing uh, several Baptist preachers being whipped in the public square there in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia one day. And uh, he, uh, he heavily influenced people like Thomas Jefferson and uh, people like that. Even, even uh, George Washington, even though he was an Episcopal, uh, he could see that this persecution of another religious leg didn't really set well with him. Back to most of the founding fathers. And when the Bill of Rights finally was put down, that's one of the first things they put in there, was you have the right of religion. And that Congress shall make no law establishing religion in this country. Your soul is free to choose who God deals with you about. And it's a great thing. Um... But these early Baptists, they challenged. The, see, they would get up and they would preach about the sins of the church members in the big churches. Oh, that was a no-no. And they would preach about the bad Christian principles that were not being observed. or Well, they, they were just being poorly observed. And they'd preach about that. And of course, uh, people got more and more and more under conviction. And so they tried to stop them. But in those days, it was really not hard to tell who was the man of God and who wasn't. Nowadays, it's a little harder. We have all kinds of denominations. We have all kinds of independent churches. We have all churches of any stri uh, stripe, size. How do you tell when a guy gets up in the pulpit... How do you tell he's a man of God? Well, the first thing this passage talks about is it talks about spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are not unknown in the church. We have spiritual gifts in this church. Now, uh, when when most people nowadays talk about spiritual gifts, they, uh, they talk about talking in tongues or something or the gift of healing. But look, there is uh, something called the gift of helps. You know, some people have the gift of helps. Uh, there's the gift of giving. If you like to give to the Lord. Uh, there's, there's just kind of gifts like that that nobody talks about. And when we get down into the chapter, we're going to deal with some of these gifts. But I, there's some several things you need to know about God's gifts in general. God may have given you a gift. Well... If you go to Romans chapter 11, verse 29, you know what it says there? And maybe you ought to circle this verse in the Bible. It says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God never takes back His gifts. There's no takesy backsies when God's gifts is concerned. God gives you a gift. God expects you to use that gift for Him. Uh, one of the tr most tragic things on this planet is people that have gifts from God, but they don't use them for God. You see this a lot in the entertainment industry. There's people that have, they're obviously gifted from God with the gift of music in their life. Do they use it for the Lord? Do they sing Jesus Christ's praises? No. They sing some pop song and they make a lot of money and there's nothing wrong with that. But they don't sing anything about the Lord, about the, His blessed Son or the truths of the Bible or anything else. And they're taking a gift that God gave them and they're squandering it. 
Does God take away their gift? No, he doesn't. Now, take someone like Elvis. I believe Elvis had a gift of God. Did Elvis use it for God? Well, occasionally he'd make a gospel album. But mostly his life was a mess. He wasn't even a very good testimony if he was Christian. So what happened to him? Well, God took him home. God took him home. Same thing with Hank Williams. There's stories about Hank Williams really being a Christian. And God took him home early. You know, uh, God gives you these things and God doesn't take them back. That gives a responsibility to us. It's a heavy responsibility. Not only that, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 7 and 8, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So we get the gift of grace from God because Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he could give us gifts from God. So we'll put that in plain English. The gifts we get from God are by God's grace. It's God's grace that gives us gifts. We don't deserve God's gifts, any of them, but God gives them to us. You say, well, this is something God's given me that I'm good at or, or I have some talent or, I have, uh, or I'm smarter than the average bear or something. Well, that is given to you by the grace of God. And by the grace of God, you need to use it. That's a very interesting predicament to be in. Think when you get to heaven... And God says, that, that thing I gave you down there, did you use it? You say, well, Lord, I, I well, well, what did you do with it? What did you do with it? Now, this brings me to my last point under this first thing. Is God's gift should always be used for God's purposes. God's gift should always be used for God's purposes. Now, sometimes God's purpose is to make a living for your family. That's part of God's purpose. I'm not saying if, you, if you're good at uh, you know, building, making shoes, you shouldn't be a shoemaker and make a living for your family. But if you've got the gift of making shoes, you ought to, you ought to uh, put a few shoes on some poor people's feet and then preach the gospel to them. Because that's the purpose of the gift. Of, any gift that God gives you, he has a purpose about. And you ought to go to God and say, well, okay, God, what's your purpose? What is your purpose, God? 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek ye that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You see, Paul said uh, in a couple chapters from hence, he said, look, you got all these gifts, but what are you doing to help the church with it? Well, are, you, are, you, are you edifying each other? Or are you just beating each other on the head with the gift or trying to have, be, be one up of everybody? This is not a game you play. Oh, I've got more, get better gifts than you. I've got more gifts than you. My gifts is... Eh, no, that's not the whole point of it. The whole thing is under God's purview. He has a purpose. He has a plan. It's by His grace. And it's a gift from Him. So spiritual gifts are not unknown. Now, I want to compare two things here by well of illustration. Let's say you have a kernel of corn. Seed corn. You have a diamond. Now, some people, if you gave them a choice between a kernel of corn, seed corn, and a diamond, they would take the diamond every time. And, you know, a diamond, pretty good thing. It's shiny. It's pretty. It increases value every year. In a hundred years, it's going to be worth more than it is now. In a thousand years, it's going to be worth the more than it is in a hundred years. But you know, a diamond never changes. It always stays a diamond. And it is a rock. You can't break it. But you take that little kernel of corn, compare it in a certain way to that diamond, it isn't much. But you take that seed corn... And you go to a nice fertile piece of ground and you put that seed corn in the ground and you feed it and you water it and you watch it grow and all of a sudden there's a corn plant. 
and that corn grows and all of a sudden there's a bunch of corn on that corn plant. Then you take those corn seeds and you plant all those little corn seeds and all of a sudden you got multiples and mul and as you do that year after year after year after year exponentially you can feed everybody on the planet for centuries with just one kernel of corn. Well, that kernel of corn is like God's gift. It doesn't look like much when you first get it. But you put it where God wants it to do, and you, you fulfill the purpose that God made it for. Oh boy. You have lots of you have lots of lots of stuff after a while. Secondly, I want to say the Holy Spirit. His main job in doing anything in your life is replacing the evil spiritual influences in your life when you were lost. Now, I don't care when you got saved or how you got saved or where you got saved. If you got saved, before you got saved, you had spiritual, evil spiritual influences in your life. And God the Holy Spirit wants to replace those. That's why Paul reminded them that they were Gentiles and they used to worship idols. And now they're gods and they don't anymore. Now, you go to ancient Greece and Rome, and you had all kinds of spiritual people floating around. You had mystics, and you had prophets, and you had oracles, and you had soothsayers, and all kinds of people that predicted the future and told, told you uh, uh, things from the gods. And, and there was all kinds of people like that floating around, just like we have today. So when you worship the gods back, back in pagan days, you had all kinds of spiritual gobbledygook going on. So now they were Christians and God was giving him some spiritual stuff and they didn't know quite what to do with it. Or I had to handle it or what it was supposed to do. So I think Paul had to remind him there was a plan. God had a plan. And it was basically replacing one thing with another. Look. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was led of the Holy Spirit up to a place of tempting. Remember Matthew chapter 4 verse 1? It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Luke 4 1 says, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost <coughs> returned from Jordan <coughs> excuse me, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he spent 40 days and 40 nights being tempted. So even the Lord Jesus Christ had to overcome this bunch of evil spiritual stuff going on in this world. And that's all around us. Um, I remember when I used to live over in uh, um, Florida town. Um, one of the goofiest people I ever met uh, was this lady out in front of her house. She had this sign saying, Palms Red, Spiritual Advisor. And I had to go collect this lady's paper money. She never paid by mail. She always made me come and get it. I think she did that on purpose. And, man, I remember the first time she opened the door. <laughs> she had hair frizzled out to here. Uh, she had a long, crooked nose. And I, said, I thought to myself when she opened the door, I said, you know, and I thought to myself, I said, lady, if you had a black pointy hat and a, a broom and a black cape, uh, you could uh, play the part of the Wicked Witch of the West, boy. Uh, Jesus had to face all that in his day. We have to face it in our day. Now, in America, we don't seem to encounter it very often, but you go to the mission field, uh, I, I, you talk to Brother Tamung, I remember when he was here, he talked about uh, fighting these kind of people, that they would literally come out against his ministry. They don't do that here anymore. We live in a country where we have freedom of religion, so they can't. Uh, but I'm sure you talk to many of them on the mission field, and they'll tell, tell you that this is something you have to face all the time. Um, look, following the Holy Spirit will lead you 
to a good life. Okay. Is there a problem? You better go find out what's wrong. All right, let us know. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you be with uh, Brother Clay and his family as they go find out what's wrong. I've been kind of worried about this myself, God, because it's not like Sister Cindy to miss church. Lord, I pray you just uh, help him to find out. I pray that when they get there, it's uh, nothing bad. Um, God, I pray you help them, give him wisdom. Uh, Lord, and uh, if there is something wrong, I pray you just to intervene. And God, uh, protect uh, our... Uh, God, these people, I love them. God, they're, they're part of our church family. They're my brothers and sisters. And God, I don't want to see any harm come to them. So I pray that you'll put your hand, your mighty hand, uh, God, and protect uh, th these folks as they go, Lord. Uh, please uh, help them, God. And I pray you bless them, God. And uh, Lord, uh, help us to... Uh, just keep on keeping on, Lord. And I pray you just be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Well, you know, now, uh, are, do you wonder? I, I mean, what do you think this is all about? This is spiritual interference from, from you know where, because I'm preaching uh, about spiritual interference from you know where. Uh, look, when you follow the Holy Spirit, he will lead you to a good life. Everybody wants a good life. Romans 8, 13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's not a good life. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You say, well, how does God help us? Well, he knows that when we give up the evil stuff of our old life and we replace it with his stuff, that we're going to get a fight interference. And when that happens, we have to go to him. We have to say, Abba, Father, help us. And he'll show us the way. Our country boasts itself of liberty. But you know where real liberty comes from? It comes from God the Holy Spirit's leading. When our country was founded by them, uh, there was a lot of Christian people that had their hand in founding this country. That's why we had liberty and we had freedom. Galatians 5.18 says, But if ye be led by the spirit of the Spirit, you are not under the law. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, we have laws in this country. But if you're living right and doing right, what do you have to fear about the law? You don't. There was a recent study made. Did you know that this recent study showed there was an all-time church attendance in this country? All-time church attendance. We've had, we have more people going to church at any time in our history. Of course, there's many more people in our, than we've ever had in our history. This same study, however, shows that there's an all-time low in moral standards. We're talking about divorce, abortion, cheating, dancing, uh, drinking, gambling, abusing children and spouses, and all this other stuff. And any time in our history, there's hasn't been as much as the, of this stuff as there is right now. There, there's uh, a high rate of this sinful stuff, even though people are going to church. You see, many practice justification, as in they justify what they're trying to do, rather than sanctification. That's what Paul is talking about here. Sanctification. Now, let me tell you what all spiritual gifts are about. This is an introduction to this chapter. All spiritual gifts from God are about honoring and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. If a man gets up 
where a person gets up and they claim to speak for God and they do not honor or glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not speaking for God. End of story. I don't care who they are, where they come from, what, what their degree says, what Bible they're preaching out of, they need to preach and teach to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the basis of all God's wisdom and judgment. So how do you know that? Romans chapter 11. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, who is it talking about there? It's talking about Jesus Christ. The end of all and beginning of all, God's wisdom and counseling and things that he has to tell you, whether in person or by his messenger, all have to do with of him, through him, and to him, and to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's the whole point. That's the point of this sermon. Our spiritual gifts honor Christ. The, the, the good things that come in our life from the Holy Spirit of God honor Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Romans chapter 15 Verse number 16. Romans 15, 16 says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering, excuse me, the gospel of God. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore whereof that I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. All this spiritual stuff that God gives us are things that pertain to God. And they should honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God the Holy Spirit works in our life, whether it's through gifts or opportunities or many other things, it ought to lift the Lord Jesus Christ higher and higher in our lives. Some Christians nowadays simply do not glorify Jesus. There's a, uh, some of these are funny. Uh, there's a few Christians uh, that it may be described of their life. It's grace grafted onto a crab stick. <laughs> I think that's funny. Uh, and then there's people that have thorn and thistle theology. <laughs> They're kind of sticky. Ouch. And then we have uh, people. Now this is one of mine. I say some people is baptized in pickle juice. <laughs> the dill variety. Sour pickle. Then, of course, there's some Christians that are just spiritual stickweeds. That's all they are, just spiritual stickweeds. So what do you do to avoid this? Well, you listen to God and you use what He gives you for His glory and His benefit. And you know what? Along the way, God will take care of your family. God will take care of you. God will take... Uh, I mean, those people that stand up and are working for God, God takes care of. In conclusion, well, you know, I've got a blank sheet of paper on the back of this sermon because there's something that you need to conclude it. You need to go home. You need to spend some quiet time during the next week or so. You need to say, God, Give me a report card. How am I doing? What are the gifts you've given me? How am I using them? And what do you think of what I'm doing? And let God give you a report card. And then when the report card comes back, uh, maybe you'll get some A's and B's. 
Maybe you get some C's that you got to work on. But if you get some D's and F's, those things you need to improve on really bad quickly. Paul's fixing to give them a lesson here in this chapter about spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are a great thing. They're one of the best things God ever gave Christians. But unless they're controlled by God, unless the purposes are fulfilled, that's God's purposes, unless they're run and operated and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, they're not much. All they are is just a Christian circus. Like the carnival that's coming across the street. So, the best way to tell if a person that gets up and is God's man, God's messenger, is you be God's person. You be God's person. Heavenly Father, help us now. Lord, I, I pray you help the Mathers as they uh, had to go home and leave in the middle of service. And Lord, we just uh, put them in your hands. And God, I pray you be with them, Lord, and help them. And I pray you just bless them, God, please. Uh, and bless us all as we go home. Protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And